school now, I know, and for some of you, probably it's a bit, a bit discomfort, but I can guarantee you that uh, the presentation made by Professor Tony Venezons and the distinguished uh, discussants will make your time, time very important. So, uh, I must welcome Professor uh, Anthony Venezons for coming here to our university. And uh, you know that Happy University is a uh, university uh, in this part of the world. And uh, we are very much uh, you know, glad that you are with us. I must thank World Bank and uh, Dr. Martin Rama. He uh, was very instrumental in organizing this event. Thank you, Martin. Uh, of course, thanks to two special guests, Professor Naso Begum. Uh, Honorable Chairman of our Economics Department and uh, uh, Dr. Ajay Shokyo Lalumpuya, uh, the new Dean of our Faculty of Social Science University of Canada. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, three discussants, uh, Dr. Mr. Dino Raman, Chairman, PPRC, thank you, uh, sir. Uh, Professor Mr. Dino Raman, uh, Distinguished Fellow of CPD, thank you, sir. And Dr. Bosco Chandukar, Chairman Simon, Professor of the World Economics Faculty. So today uh, we are having this special lecture uh, by, as I said, Professor Anthony Venables, and uh, the topic is very relevant to us. Actually, the broad topic was urbanization in the developing world, challenges and opportunities. But I can see that Professor Venables actually he put <laughs> cities for development, creating livability and productivity, which are which are definitely is a kind of subset of the broad topic. And to just very briefly introduce uh, Professor Anthony Venables, is a professor of economics at the University of Oxford, where he also directs the Center for the Analysis of Resource-Rich Economies. He is also a member of the IGC's Steering Committee, International Growth Center. He is a fellow of the British Academy and of the Econometric Society. His former positions include Chief Economist at the UK Department for International Development, which is known as BFID. Professor at the London School of Economics, research manager of the trade research group in the World Bank, and advisor to the UK Treasury. So he has published extensively in the areas of international trade, especially economies, economics, including work on trade and profit competition, economic integration, multinational forms, and economic geography. And actually, uh, well, I teach uh, uh, international trade at the graduate level. And when it comes to economic geography and some very relevant issues on international trade, actually, I have cited and referred uh, some of the very important works by Professor Venables and the students who attended my course, they know all this thing. So we are actually really very grateful to Professor Anthony Venables and as I said, the topic is very relevant to us and what the presentation was going to be, actually uh, I can see that I can to expect the writings from him, uh, it will uh, talk about, it will focus on the economics of the organization. And more importantly, that's something I would say would make the discussion very interesting that he will also talk about the political economic side. Uh, and, and that I think that may, will make us make the discussion very interesting, not just looking at the whole issue from a very, very uh, new classical point of view, but bringing in other, other uh, challenging issues as well. So with this, uh, the structure of today's program is like that. Uh, Professor Venables, you will give a lecture. Uh, for 40, 45 minutes, then we have three distinguished uh, uh, discussants. But before that, I know uh, my friend Shokar uh, Bhuya, we might have to, uh, so you may have other programs. Yeah, 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 but yeah, just pop up program. and let me know when you want to. Or you can, if you want to make some comments. Uh, I think if I go first, and oh. I'll, I'll just welcome him and leave. Please, I'll please, please. Okay. And then we also have Professor Nazam Begum, and then uh, what we'll do, we'll have We'll allocate uh, five to six minutes, uh, a little bit or a little bit more than that, to the distinguished discussers. Then we'll open up the floor for questions. So I really expect uh, the students from economics, development studies, uh, and other relevant department. Uh, you know, whoever are present here, please, you know, ask questions and make some challenging questions. So which I think uh, you know to be very very make this uh, this uh, two hour session very interesting. So with this, may I request uh, Shokyul, please, if you want to make an uh, introductory welcome remark, please. Yes. Uh, 
be solved. So, distinguished guest, Professor Bani Venables, my good friend, Selim Raihan, and other distinguished discussions in the days, and my colleagues and students, very good afternoon to you. And I'm sorry that I have to leave early, but the title of the talk is very intriguing because we live in a city which needs to be livable. So in Dhaka City, I don't know, Professor Benable, you face traffic jam and other problems when you came here. So I think your talk and the discussion here will, <coughs> will give us some clues how to solve the problem of our city. And I welcome you here at the Faculty of Social Sciences. And I would hope that you will be involved with the Faculty of Social Sciences, especially with the Department of Economics in collaboration, collaborative research, maybe thesis supervision, publication, this kind of things. So with these brief remarks, I <coughs> take off from here. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shafiul Alabuya, uh, for this very introductory and welcome remarks. So with this, may I have a request from Sir for a minute to make a presentation. Okay, good. Um, thanks. Um, well, let me start by saying it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and obviously offering thanks both to the university uh, for arranging this event uh, and to the World Bank and Martin for, uh, for, for bringing me to, uh, uh, to, to the city, to Dakar. Um, we have an exciting research project uh, on the city and on the future of the city, um, which I'm not going to be talking about in detail today, but I'm not going to be talking about it at all today. Um, as you see from the title uh, that I have here, let me just this is working. Yeah, as you as you see from the from the title, I've really given a very very general uh, title, uh, and as you were told, it changed it went from one, one very general title to another another very general title. So, in Oxford and the London School of Economics at the moment, we've got a big program of research on on urbanisation in developing countries. But I'm not going to be talking about particular research papers uh, that come out of that project. And indeed, most of the projects, most of the emphasis has been on Africa uh, rather than Asia. I'm not going to be talking about that. What I'm going to do is give you more of an overview of urban economics and new thinking in that area. Now, my reasons for that, well, it's a couple of reasons. First, I was told uh, by Martin yesterday that you would probably be mainly economists in the audience um, but probably not urban economists, so you wouldn't actually know much urban economics. That's one reason. And the second reason was, I just think it is so important that people, policymakers, citizens, students, uh, that people get to think of the city as a complete functioning economic system with lots of different component parts. <laughs> Great, thanks. I was thinking I was a bit quiet. I was wondering whether uh, whether anyone was hearing. But it's all right. I haven't said anything yet. I'm just warming up. It was just a general introduction. No. It, it's very important that people are able to think about the city uh, as a whole uh, with all these component parts uh, interacting. So I think urban economics has a lot to offer um, for the thinking of. Well, as I said, policy makers, students, citizens. I also think standard urban economics doesn't go far enough. It needs, it needs, needs, needs stretching and extension, which are some of the things we're working on in the Oxford, uh, LSE, and elsewhere. But anyway, it's to try and give you, this, this lecture is to try and give you a sense of how the, the different component elements of a city, how they fit together, uh, how they can go wrong. Uh, in some cases, and spectacularly successful, uh, work success, uh, successfully in other cases. Okay, is this, can everyone still hear me? Right. Just, if you just get in the back, do you hear it well? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so. No. <laughs> so yeah, I usually move more than this. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, it's, 
Is, it, is that better? Is that any better? Yeah? Okay, looks like I'm going to have to hold it. So, uh, this one. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, I'll try, I'll try and hang on to this one uh, throughout. Okay, starting point. When I think about you know, the really big economic issues facing the world uh, over the next 30, 40, 50 years, number one is obviously climate change. Number two, in my mind, is, is urbanization, simply because of the scale of uh, the challenge that is faced. So I hope everyone can see this. There, there are figures for different regions of the world uh, with years on the horizontal axis and urban populations. So forget the darker shading, uh, that, that doesn't, doesn't matter. But it's just giving projections of the growth of world urban population uh, over the next uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, top right there is, is Asia, which obviously in absolute terms is facing uh, the largest growth, uh, up to something over, over 3 billion people uh, living in cities. That's, that's Asia as a whole. But I think the continent where the, the issues are going to be most acute is Africa, in, in the bottom right hand corner there. But what you see is well, you see, see half a billion Africans entering cities over the next 30 years or so. That's a trebling of the urban population. That means that over 30 or 40 years, they have to build as much urban structure as they have in the whole of last you know, previous history. That means they've got to build almost as much urban structure as the whole of Europe and North America put together, right, with half a billion people. Uh, just in, in Africa, right? So if you think of the scale of that challenge and the time scale, you know, 30 or 40 years, it, it's a mind-boggling challenge. As I said, it, it's up there with, with climate change in terms of the really difficult issues uh, that we've got to get to grips with. So, yeah, re reason one is this is the scale of the problem. Uh, we have to understand the key issues clearly. Few other introductory remarks. Yeah, cities you know, always have been, always will be uh, the drivers of growth and development. Uh, clear from from history. And the way I think the, the, the way I've heard someone talking about it is, well, what, what is a country's uh, economic development strategy now? It's it's urban strategy. You know, that's where the you know, majority of people are or will be living, and this huge transitional process. Uh, on the way. So development strategy is urban strategy. So you better really understand uh, the urban urban issues. And of course the urban issues are fascinating from an economic perspective because there's almost a uniquely complex uh, interplay between you know, private activity and public sector involvement and support. So you know, private investment will drive growth Who's going to be taking the decisions on that? Well, millions and millions and hundreds of millions of, of individual households, individual firms. So obviously it's going to be private sector activity that really drives things. And you know, ultimately, those decisions are going to be guided by market forces. But at the same time, cities are a very, very policy intensive area. You know, public involvement, effective public involvement is, is, is absolutely uh, essential. Obviously it's essential for provision of uh, infrastructure, public services, and it's also essential because left to the market, in the urban context there are very many market failures. Uh, I've list, listed some here. Uh, there are positive externalities uh, that I'll talk about in a bit more detail uh, in a couple of minutes. So it's not perfect markets, there are externalities. There are negative externalities. Um, what do I put it there? Negative externalities created by dense human contact uh, of all sorts, uh, contagion, disease, congestion, whatever. So there are negatives. And then also, as I'll explain as I go through, there are quite subtle coordination failures where if you just leave it to individual decision takers in the market, you don't actually get, get to the place uh, you want to get to. Uh, things go wrong. So you've got this very complex set of interactions uh, between private individuals in a market system 
and the role of the public sector in uh, the infrastructure, fixing externalities, coordinating behaviour. So it's, it's a quite distinctive area of economics, which is why it gets interesting uh, and challenging. And as I said at the beginning, really important people can see uh, cities as, as a whole, as functioning uh, economic systems. OK. Um, let me, with, with those as introductory comments, let me, uh, let me start with the meat of this. What I want to suggest is to think about cities, we've got to see them as a balance between the benefits and the costs. The benefits are ultimately high productivity and amenity value and the social contact and things. But ultimately, cities deliver high productivity. So I want to talk about that. But cities also have high costs. So cities have to somehow manage this balance between the productivity advantage they can bring and the cost penalty they surely bring. Uh, they've got to manage that balance. Um, the market system gets you part of the way there, but, but not completely. So it's managing that balance that's uh, critical. So I want to talk first about productivity, uh, then about urban costs, then about that balance. And that balance I've called urban equilibrium. But by equilibrium, I don't mean a situation of no change. I just mean, you know, equilibrium in the economist sense of where things sort of hang together more or less in a consistent way. So I want to go through those building blocks, how they hang together, and then some remarks about policy, um, land use, infrastructure, uh, and so on. At the very end of my concluding statement, I think I'll have one line on political economy. <laughs> so uh, apologies for possibly having uh, Mr. Bisnay from the chair on the extent to which I'll be talking about the political economy issues. It's going to be mainly economics. OK. Okay, pro 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 productivity. So I want to go through yeah, the plus side productivity, the downside costs, and then you know, the balance of how we sort of fix it um, so that the benefits are greater than the costs and there's some surplus to be had. Okay, there's a lot of research, a lot of data telling us that cities, large cities, have got uh, high, high productivity, higher productivity than the than, than, than surrounding areas. Uh, surrounding places. A uh, lot, lot, lot of research on that, a lot of evidence, a uh, lot, of, lot of theoretical reasoning. Okay, why, why is it that cities uh, should, be, should be more productive? Well, there are two sort of fundamental reasons, I think. One is that cities attract uh, the high-skilled, well-educated, uh, dynamic people. Okay? But that's a bit of a zero-sum game, right? So these people move to cities, so they're not somewhere else. So that might be to the benefit of cities, but it's not necessarily to the benefit of the, the economy as a whole. And the other reason is that um, the urban environment actually causes people uh, to be more productive. Okay, and I think you know, most economists uh, now believe that that is true. And there's a huge amount of econometric work looking at um, across cities, across firms, across industries, across individuals, all sorts of different data sources. Uh, to try and really carefully pin down this productivity effect. And I've got put the numbers there, possibly a little bit small for people in fact to see. But basically, if in the cross section of cities you double the city size, you raise productivity on average by 3 or 5 percent. Okay? Looking in the cross section. 3 or 5 percent doesn't sound like very much. Until, of course, you realize that cities go from, you know, I think of Dublin, 100,000, 200,000, 400, they you know, up to 14 million. That's an awful lot of doublings, right? So, you know, the 3 or 5%. Yeah, you know, London is 30 or 40% more productive per person than the, the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, so, yeah, these, 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 these are the big productivity effects. And I think robust evidence. A couple of remarks on the evidence. 
Um, most of the research has been on developed countries, but work on developing countries is now taking place. There's a recent paper by Ed Major and others suggesting these effects are actually larger in developing countries uh, than, than developed. Uh, it's, the comment there is difficult, but uh, suggesting that's true. There's a lot of questions about the spatial range of these productivity effects. You know, are they city specific? Are they, you know, is it over five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 100 kilometers? Um, probably over a uh, sort of travel to work area, uh, whatever that means here. Uh, so, you know, within city areas. And there's debate about the sectoral range, right? These productivity effects, are you getting them across all activities in the city or are you getting them just in your manufacturing sector or just in a particular manufacturing sector and certainly in developed countries it's probably less now about manufacturing than things like finance creative sectors uh, hollywood bollywood um, these are the areas that the sectors where activity seems to really cluster together uh, to get these productivity advantages but why? Yeah, what, what, what are the mechanisms? So, 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 so why should this, this be going on? Well, again, let me just do a list of the fairly, fairly standard reasons that people talk about. Okay, cities offer yeah, proximity. Um, things are close together. Um, density, connectivity, uh, intense economic interactions. Uh, what does that mean? Well, there are a couple of direct benefits from that. You know, you economise on transport costs, possibly, possibly not, but in some circumstances. Um, it's certainly cheaper to provide utilities, and there's good World Bank research on this. Uh, the cost of providing you know, power, sanitation, utilities is lower if people are all close together than if you've got to reach lots of small villages. Okay? But then people get together and give away their firm secret to another firm. Uh, so that knowledge sharing goes on. But above all, I think the real important mechanism here is the one that goes back to Adam Smith. It's, 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 it's scale and specialization. You know, suppose that you really, really want to become a specialist uh, in one thing. You want to become really good at something. Okay, well that's surely high productivity. Providing you've got someone to sell that specialism to. If you're in a tiny village, becoming an absolute expert in, I don't know, um, some aspect of finance, uh, there's no one to buy, buy it from you, right? So there's only the incentive to really get specialist skills if you're in a big market with lots of potential employers uh, to buy that skill. So it's really the incentive to, to get deep, deep specialized skills that I think is, is at the heart of this, this real productivity effect. Okay, so workers specialise, specialisation raises productivity. Well, final point on the productivity mechanism here. Um, well, two final points, I think. Collectively, the productivity things are called the you know, agglomeration effects, agglomeration forces. They mean that there's increasing returns to scale, you know, big cities have higher productivity. But really importantly, there's a sort of external benefit here. If you set up your very, very specialist firm with your deep, you know, high productivity in one thing, do you capture all the benefit yourself? Well, if you've done your you know, economics 101, if you're a perfectly discriminating monopolist, you do. But if you're not a perfectly discriminating monopolist, you don't. You're probably selling at a price a bit less than you can extract. So some of the benefit gets passed to the to your customers, right? They're getting benefit from it. So there's a market failure here. It's, it's an externality. You're not capturing the full benefit. Okay, that's a couple of words on, on productivity, one, one side of the equation. The other side, costs. Cities are high cost. Uh, what do we know about that? Well, I'm not going to tell you about commuting and travel costs, but you know much more about that than I do. Uh, contagion, uh, yeah, the downside of human proximity, I've already mentioned, um, that too is an urban cost. What about high land prices? 
is that an urban cost? Well, it's a cost to the individual that pays uh, for the land, right? You know, you're paying high rents. But that's not a social cost. It's not a real cost. It's a transfer payment, okay? You're paying your rent to your landlord. It's a transfer payment. So I put three items of cost on that list. Two are real costs, but the third is not, okay? It's a private cost, but it's a transfer payment to someone else. And that's essential. That point is essential in the way we think about cities. Well, I told you it mainly be economic student, so you've got, you know, you've got marginal cost here and things, all right? Uh, let me put the bits together. Productivity, costs, and get out the, the urban, urban equilibrium. So I want to do this in a very simple way and then, then sort of enrich it a little bit, get a bit more from it. Okay, let's have population on the horizontal axis. And think of that as ordering population by distance from the city center where all the jobs are. So let's pretend all the jobs are in the center. So as I move along the uh, horizontal axis, I'm adding more people, but by making them live further and further away, because you know, there's no land, right? You're moving further and further away from the center. So the productivity curve is the um, is this one, right? The bigger the city, uh, the more valuable workers are. So productivity is going up. So that's kind of labor demand. It's what firms would be willing to pay. Okay. The cost curve is this one. And that's a labor supply curve, right? So W zero is what you get if you're in um, working in agriculture. Um, and you're willing to work in the city if you get W0 plus something to compensate you for, for the costs you don't pay. Okay? So the equilibrium is where those two curves intersect at point E. So that gives city size. Okay? So the way to think about that is you know, you're the last worker to enter the city. You're living right out at the edge, facing hideous commuting costs of you know, that vertical distance. Right? But it's just worthwhile to do it because you're getting this uh, the wage from the labor demand curve. Okay? So ease the equilibrium point. Okay, well, a bit of, bit of basic economics. We've got productivity, we've got costs, we've got the balance between them. Is there any surplus out of all this? Or have costs soaked up the whole of the productivity? In which case, you know, we really wouldn't want to see cities anywhere at all. Well, yes, there is a surplus. It's area W, W0, E, it's that triangle. Okay? So the labor supply is a marginal cost curve. It's for, for each worker that comes in, right? Uh, but productivity is being received by everyone. That's an average. So area under the marginal is the total cost, the area under the average uh, is, is the total benefit, and the triangle is, is, is a surplus. Let me put that differently. Everyone is, as, as we look at the costs, right? you know, the guy who lives here is uh, you know, facing, he's losing that way by not working in agriculture, he's paying that much commuting cost, and that little distance Right? That vertical distance is the rent that you pay. So everyone's paying that cost, but the rent is a transfer payment, right? And that's the surplus. That's the surplus that the city's getting. So that triangle is the benefit of cities. And it's approximately equal, or in this diagram, exactly equal to the total rent uh, created, yeah, land rent in the city. So that's basic textbook uh, urban economics. So cities do create surplus, but in the simplest possible case, most of it goes to the landlords, right, to the landowners. Okay. That's the textbook case. That's insightful, but, but, but it's a little bit sort of sterile and boring, isn't it? I mean, I said there were externalities, increasing returns, coordination failures. We need a much richer, more interesting story than that. So let me try and give you a bit of a flavor for that. And this is, this is going to be difficult, I think, but, but, but let me try. 
We've got increasing returns. That means the more you do, the greater the benefit. Okay, so that's a positive feedback going on. There are other positive feedbacks in cities. You know, the better the city's doing, the more tax revenue it can raise, the better the infrastructure it can afford, the better the city will do. So there are lots of sort of positive feedback things going on, right? Let's try and tell some better stories about those positive feedbacks. Well, in economic models with positive feedbacks, you get yeah, nice, rich, interesting behavior. You get vicious circles where you know, you've know you got positive feedback, but you start heading down and you head down faster. Or you might go and you know, start doing well and head up faster. So vicious and, and virtuous circles going on. So the virtuous circle, yeah, you've got a good policy environment, you've got good infrastructure, uh, you've got positive expectations about the future of the city, uh, so there's lots of investment going on, investment brings agglomeration, the productivity benefits, that creates jobs and income, that raises tax revenue, that gives you more infrastructure, and off you go. Okay? And there's, dare I say it, the, the African uh, path, where you've got lots of core policy infrastructure, uh, weak expectations about the future growth, uh, very low investment, uh, and, and so on. The downward story. So we have the simple model. We'd like to enrich it. I'm going to give you a very simple example of how to enrich it in a moment, but very simple. Uh, but more generally, we know when we do enrich it and put this stuff in, um, yeah, we get virtuous circles, vicious circles, some cities do it very well, others, others not, you know, the, the African case. Um, we also know that it's very hard to start new cities, okay? It's hard to start new cities because a new city doesn't have the productivity advantage, right? Who's going to be the first mover uh, to a new city? Um, you're not getting any valuation benefits. So it's hard to start new clusters, hard to start new cities. And of course, if it's hard to start new cities as your population is growing and your country is urbanizing, then you're going to get excess privacy, by which I mean the largest city is just going to go on and get larger and larger and larger because it's so hard to do anything to start a new city. All right? So these are obviously kind of yeah, re relevant, important stories here. Um, so yeah, I really hope you can see the economics uh, underlying that. It's important to uh, understand. Okay, I'll try and give you one simple example of these sort of you know, funny things that happen when we've got increasing returns uh, and all that. So this is actually something that we did very much in the African context. Let me kind of talk you through this, 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 this figure. Do we get on students who use, use the diagrams? Same axes as before. Um, these labor supply curves, same as before, right? They're the city costs. But the labor demand curve, the productivity thing, I've now said, let's give it two segments. One is downward sloping, the other is upward sloping. The story behind that is the following. Most cities do some tradable stuff, you know, garments, whatever it is, that maybe have increasing returns and acceleration and a really thriving cluster. But they also do, mainly do, non tradable stuff, partly for the city, but also for the wider hinterland. So by non tradable, I mean, well, it's ketchup, restaurant meals, but it's also sort of beer, cement, supplying so things into the, into the local or regional market. Okay? That of necessity has diminishing returns to scale. Because the local market is of given size, and the more you sell into it, you're going to depress the price. So that gives you diminishing returns. Right? So I patched together those two stories. Right? Some of your population is going to be doing this diminishing returns activity, some's going to be doing the, the increasing returns, maybe. 
Okay, so the story from here would be, you know, African cities are typically stuck uh, at EN, right? They have essentially no internationally tradable activities. Um, yeah, they get some foreign exchange from natural resources or international aid or something, but, but they're, they're stuck, right? Or maybe they're stuck at EL, right? Whereas a city like Dakar is out at ET, it's surely got tradable stuff uh, and, and the increasing concerns. But the point I want you to take away from this is that if you just look at this, yeah, that line, right? There are three equilibria, right? It intersects three times. There's a bad equilibrium, yeah, EL, the poverty trap, if you like. There's a good one here where you got tradables as well as not tradables. And there's no one in between that's unstable, so we won't worry about that. Okay? So the message is that you know, we have when we have all these ingredients, the externalities, the increasing returns, the real possibility that you could get stuck in a bad situation uh, like EL. You want to be an ET. But how do you do that? Well, you import a complete agglomeration of a thousand firms all at the same time, but of course not. You just you can't do that. You, 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 you're just stuck. Right? There's a real trap faced by, by some cities in the world. Um, I'm not suggesting that guy is there. Yeah. On, on the contrary, it clearly has a tradable sector. But I just want to give you a flavour, but it's basic economics and then how to, uh, how to accept it. Okay. Let me go from there to just spending uh, 10 minutes talking about some uh, policy stuff. So I'm trying to give you this, 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 this flavour of productivity with the increasing returns and all that, costs, how it hangs together, how it creates surplus. Um, how do you make sure that you maximise the productivity, minimise the costs, and come out of a good equilibrium? rather than one of those, the, 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 those traps. Okay, well, you've also got to create an environment where people want to invest residentially uh, and, and in business. Uh, there's no single recipe for it, but four points that I want to make. Point one, it's really important to use land efficiently uh, in, in cities. If you think about it, land is, in, in the city, the, the scarce factor is land. You can import capital, you know, labor will flow in. Uh, it's land that is the scarce factor. So using that efficiently is absolutely essential. What do I mean by that? Well, first, it's sort of enabling owners of land to actually use it, uh, to build it, to develop it. And we know that that's sometimes blocked by yeah, insecure tenure, um, inappropriate building regulations, inability to access mortgage finance. Um, we know these are problems, problems that need to be addressed. Also, you need to make sure that land is occupied by those who value it greatest, uh, value it most highly, which essentially means tradability of land in the these markets. So using land uh, efficiently uh, is important. Using that efficiently typically gives rise to the monocentric city. That is to say, a situation where you know, firms want to cluster for productivity benefits, so they're grouped together in one or two areas. Um, residential land spreads out either side. Let me give you some pictures uh, of the monocentric city. Okay, the monocentric city sometimes sounds like a bit of a textbook thing. You know, we've got all the, you know, all the employment in the centre. Uh, all the residential out of the edges. But, but look at these pictures. Um, I hope you can see them. So this is employment density in London, New York, and Hong Kong. It's clearly monocentric. Yeah, there are lots of spikes around the edge, but the yeah, centre of Hong Kong, centre of Manhattan, centre of London, huge, huge employment spikes. Residential, not as spiked, but again, monocentric, right? The centre, well, Hong Kong is special because it, it's geography. Um, but Hong Kong, then New York, then London, uh, all of that sort of cone shape. 
So what I'm saying is that's a manifestation of using land efficiently, right? Because land in the center is valuable, that's where firms are clustering, so that's a north they effectively use uh, for employment, uh, and then you know, residentially, land close to the center is more valuable, more people live there, and that's, that's efficient land use. Uh, that's Dakar, by the way. Uh, left hand is residential. It is is uh, important. Uh, right hand is residential. So it's pretty monocentric. Although there's a rather spectacular uh, hole here, uh, which we'll be talking about <laughs> over, over the next couple of days. Right? Uh, but that, that, that's the pattern of important residential density, uh, Dakar. And of course, it's fairly general worldwide. These are cities around the world. Um, the horizontal axis on those figures is distance from the center. The vertical is uh, residential density. Uh, so residential density falling off uh, in, in all of them. But it's a very different, so again, they're all drawn on the same axis. So obviously, American cities uh, down at the bottom here were constructed in an age when transport technology was pretty good. So they've got the same shape, but with no central density. Uh, other cities, Shanghai is this, the peak there, uh, were constructed, being constructed with much higher residential density. That's using land efficiently gives that pattern. The market system uh, gives that pattern. I've put here three cities where the pattern clearly doesn't hold, right? So there's lots of land close to the center that is not being used very well. Okay, now the three cities, you can all, you know, you, you, from, from, from the names, uh, you all can think of reasons why land is being used less efficiently. Uh, Johannesburg, obviously it's a legacy of apartheid. Uh, Moscow, a planned system, uh, Brasilia, uh, very much a sort of architect plan city rather than an economist or market driven uh, city shape. So these are cities where I think you would argue land was not being used efficiently. Okay, point one. Now I'm not meaning to rule out concentricity in large cities, but the message is yeah, you use land efficiently and make sure you do. Message two infrastructure, utilities, public services. Okay. What we're really after for the productivity is, is effective density. That either means physical density or good transport systems or the two together. So obviously infrastructure plays a crucial role in achieving that uh, effective density. I quite like the map here, which is um, London. And it's the, num the, color, the shading corresponds to the number of people uh, sorry, the number of jobs that can be accessed by people living in different areas in London. So in the darkest red area, people living in the darkest red area can access, if you read uh, the very top, within 45 minutes travel on public transport, you can access over a million uh, no, sorry, over two and a half million jobs. Okay? So, what is sort of economic density, yeah, maybe physical density, or maybe having a public transport system that says, yeah, within 45 minutes, yeah, public transport travel time, there are two and a half million jobs. Okay? So, yeah, London has very good public transport, and that, across the non blue area, the, the width of the non blue area is probably 15 or 20 miles, and the non blue area you're accessing certainly more than um, half a million jobs um, by public transport in less than 45 minutes. So infrastructure obviously plays a role uh, in, in, in delivering that. When we think about infrastructure, um, what are the benefits? Well, the first one is yeah, the direct user benefits. You're not spending hours and hours sitting in the car. The second one is you're increasing effective density. Yeah. But here, right, you're getting this huge amount of economic interaction through it. Um, 
And the third one, of course, the infrastructure actually changes the pattern of private investment. It, it shapes the whole city. And this is where I think infrastructure really can have a transformative effect. Let me expand on that point a little bit more. Yeah, suppose your city is growing. Uh, so suppose you know that you're going to need a secondary center. Yeah, maybe it's just a big office and shopping center somewhere on the edge of town. Right? Now, how is the market going to deliver that? Right, everyone knows you need this, in, everyone knows it would be profitable to have this you know, second center somewhere. But you don't know where. It could be there, 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 or there, right? So this is the coordination failure point. This is the point I made earlier that it's hard to start things. You know, I'm, I'm not going to invest here if I think someone else is going to, if I get the center going there, right? So what happens? Well, you get stuck without the second center. Maybe a bit of a problem in that kind of thing. You, you, you get stuck in that, in that way. How do you break out of that? You need policy. What policies? Well, one might be a city plan that says it's going to be here. But of course, city plans are sometimes not, not credible. They're not, they're not believed. Certainly, again, in the African example, they're, they're really, really not believed. So how do you credibly commit that the second center is going to be here? Answer, you put the infrastructure in, right? And so then you're sinking money in a credible commitment. So that then it shapes the private investment um, to, to, to go there and break the like trap. So yeah, infrastructure is playing lots of roles, the direct benefit, the increasing density, and the shaping expectations about the growth of the city really uh, you know, comes forward in multiple roles that it can structure to play. Okay, a um, few other little um, public policy remarks uh, rather in the same theme. Uh, coordination. Remember I said at the beginning that we had you know, millions of individuals um, plus public decisions uh, coordinating them. Um, yeah. Principally, in the first instance, the coordination is through two markets, through supply, demand, and prices. But obviously, as I was just saying, expectations matter, and that gives us the role of the city plans uh, for infrastructure. So you need to think about you know, policy as a coordinating mechanism uh, in, in, in making the city work. Uh, final point uh, on policy. Uh, well, I'll put the heading, uh, capture the surplus. Now, remember when I was, you know, I had the productivity curve, the cost curve, and I said, oh, there's an area of economic surplus uh, that the city creates. And I said, most of it goes to landlords. Should it go to landlords? Is that going to be ethically correct or um, economically efficient? Let's think about it a little bit. Okay, much of the productivity advantage of cities ends up in, in, in land values. But who's created the, that land value? It's not the, not the person who happens to you know, have a building on that piece of land at present. The land is particularly valuable because it's in the centre of the city, because it's benefiting from the infrastructure, uh, because there are jobs all around it. So the land is particularly valuable because of the actions of of other people. So I would argue that there's a strong case for capturing some of that value okay, for, for the public good, uh, for the city uh, as a whole. So the arguments for doing that are first, as I've suggested, you know, ethically, you know, the value is created by the city as a whole, not by the uh, person who happens to own the land at present. Okay, so there's an ethical case for doing it. Administratively, land taxation is relatively easy. Yeah, land doesn't move. Right? It's hard to tax things when, when they move and can escape the jurisdiction and move around. Land can't. So if you've got a proper land registry, it's administratively fairly easily. 
economically a land tax is not distortionary. Again, essentially because land can't move, you know, the, the land is just there. But of course it's really important to note that I'm talking about a land tax, not a property valuation tax. Uh, the two are often conflated with practical uses of valuation. But pure land tax um, it's, it's not sort of distortionary, it doesn't affect uh, investment decisions. And then the next point on that list. Um, Henry George, and there are things called Henry George theorems. Henry George was a 19th century American who banged on a lot about land, the social value of land, land taxes, and all that. So Enochs now has some Henry George theorems that say that under a lot of quite special circumstances, quite strong assumptions, the value of land is at least as great as the value of all the infrastructure you need to build in the city. So you can finance 100% of your infrastructure by taxing the land. Now that theorem comes in different forms and with various assumptions, but in a sense, the simplest form of it is very, very easy to see, right? Um, why do you want to spend money building infrastructure in the city? is to create a surplus, but you only want to do that if the surplus is greater than the cost of the infrastructure you've got to build to generate the surplus. Not a QED, I just proved the theorem, right? The surplus has got to be greater than the most cost of the infrastructure. Now, that's a theorem that holds under special circumstances, not generally true. Obviously, really big problems of timing. You need to do the infrastructure up front. But a land tax is going to be a continuing tax through time, so you need to borrow, and the, the borrowing is financed, it, it has collateral of the future tax revenue. So, lot, lots of you know, difficulties going from the pure simple economics to the application, but nevertheless, a really fundamental point here. Um, the city does create surplus. Most of the city, most of that surplus is capitalized in high land values. Um, it is important to have some way of taxing, some land tax, property tax, to extract some of that surplus uh, back, back to the city um, and use that to make the city function properly uh, through, through the infrastructure, investments, public services required. So, Okay, I hope I put in your head um, the yeah, idea of productivity benefits, city costs, net surplus, the tax base, but with all these increasing returns, externalities, some funny things can go on. Okay. A couple of uh, concluding comments. Okay, doing this does require innovative economic thinking, right? We're talking about increasing returns, externalities, poor pension failure. It requires tools and skills to apply these things at the city level. And those need to be very practical tools and skills uh, rather than the rather sort of abstract, you know, high level stuff I've been talking about here. But obviously, they need to be underpinned by an understanding of the city as a whole, um, which is where I started. And finally, finally, my one comment on four words uh, on, on political economy. Clearly, yeah. Public policy plays a crucial role here. So urban governance uh, is, is important. And in particular, well not in particular, but amongst other things, the authorizing environment of city authorities. If you think what I've been saying, think about cities, that authorizing environment needs, needs broad scope. It needs broad scope spatially, right? If your city is you know, spatially fragmented into different authorities, you're not going to be able to do the coordination. If your city is expanding out to rural areas with different jurisdictions, you're going to have difficulty um, uh, expanding. So you need this, the authority uh, needs spatial scope. It needs temporal scope, right? A lot of it is about investment decisions, long-run stuff shaping expectations. 
So you really do want an authority of 60, 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, years ahead. So that needs temporal scope. And then it needs functional scope. Um, I mean, if you think about some of the issues I've touched on here, there's basic public service stuff, uh, there's infrastructure, there's the legal system in land tenure, um, there are interactions with central government, um, there's uh, mortgage finance, there's the banking system, right? So the scope, I don't have to talk about human capital at all, so you know, education, skills, all that. So the scope, the functional scope, the authorizing environment that needs to be wide as well. So, a real role for public policy effectively with, with private decision making in markets, I think, is the ultimate challenge for cities. Okay, stop. Thank you, Professor uh, Menables. I think it was an excellent presentation. And uh, it also, I think, uh, would really uh, encourage a lot of discussion, which uh, would be, I think, uh, relevant to or related to uh, the city where we are living now, Marka City. I thought that probably uh, the honorable discussants and also the special guest would shed some light on uh, taking the points uh, where, uh, from the presentation of uh, Professor Menables. I was thinking uh, the first question would be actually uh, what kind of equilibrium capacity at now, that now. So where are we now? So, <laughs> so when are we between community, that could be one question. And uh, second, what are the special uh, the specific policy implications with respect to infrastructure and coordination? And uh, in, the co in the coordination side, I also would like to uh, you know, probably expect some discussion on the what he mentioned towards the end, the urban governance, the city governance, and the challenges related to that. And the probably third and final point, I thought that uh, uh, what is the cost of correcting the wrong things which have been done in the past? So whether uh, Professor Venables uh, you know, take into account in his calculation of the cost and uh, the productivity. Uh, so, with this, uh, may I request Professor Nazareno to make some comments on uh, this presentation? Yes. Thank you. 
Our main concern is not to uh, what should be the optimum level of urbanization or what should be the level of uh, urbanization. Rather, we should think of how to maximize the benefits of urbanization and minimize the problems of urbanization. As uh, Professor uh, Menabuls uh, mentioned, uh, positive externalities and negative externalities. So if I go into that, if I like to go into that, the button say when urbanization takes place, it brings many opportunities. Uh, it enhances trade and business. It enhances investment, it advances production, output, and talk about employment. In short, it is the driver of economic growth. But the problem is that when it takes place, it brings many challenges also. Uh, the first challenge opportunities associated with inadequacy of basic amenities, i.e. gas, water, electricity, etc. etc. It brings environmental degradation, it brings inadequacy of infrastructure services, massive slum, violence, socio-economic breakdown, failure of governance and so on. So, how to maximize the benefits by minimizing the uh, regarding policy formulation and and then when there will be policies relevant to organization, I think it should be considered in a holistic approach, not a piecemeal approach. <laughs> Again, there should be coordination among different policies. The policies related to urban, the policies uh, directly related to urbanization should be integrated with other policies such as um, health care policy, health policy, environmental policy, and so on. There should be integration among all the policies. There should be coordination. Uh, the second thing uh, that should be taken care of is governance issue. Uh, this is a issue of political economy, um, very sensitive issue in most of the developing countries. Uh, I uh, I don't want to go into details in such a short time. Uh, I hope that the people who are working in this field, they will take care of this issue, the governance issue. The third issue that I mentioned is public awareness. Public awareness and public cooperation is must for making the benefits of organization. Um, I can share, right now I can share an example, a recent example, uh, of our country, Dhaka city. The chikungunya disease is very rampant now. I relate it to the problem of urbanization because um, the spread is so much because of the thickly, uh, thickly this, the thick density of the population. The Take this density of population is the outcome of urbanization. The mosquitoes, even they don't have to put much effort for spreading the uh, disease or for fighting the people. They don't have to try much to bite people. So this is the problem of urbanization. Now we are uh, we, we, the public, the media, we are blaming the 
uh, mayor that he's not taking effective measures to kill the mosquitoes. Again, the mayor is blaming the public that they are not ensuring hygienic, hygienic uh, environment in their uh, home. Uh, he's blaming that the home, the home, uh, uh, the, the environment we are creating in terms of our plant and all those things, that those environments are very friendly to the mosquitoes. So what we are doing, we are blaming each other. The mayor is blaming us, we are blaming the mayor. It should not be. It should be a collaborative effort. We should make our house not friendly to the mosquito. And at the same time, the mayor should take effective measures to kill the mosquitoes. So, the, so this is the way how the all other problems of urbanization can be handled with the joint report of the public county government. To me, it seems that the problem of urbanization, the challenges of urbanization can be faced only when the government and the public are in hand in hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Nazareno, for excellent uh, intervention. Uh, may I request uh, Professor Bozla from the first to make comments? Yes. I thinking in a different way of uh, moving, uh, developing in Bangladesh. I think our uh, seven plan, I think first time in our medium term plans were mostly focused on sectoral issues, macro issues, not on the spatial or geographical aspects of uh, urbanization and those things. Those were touched, but not that details uh, that he has exposed uh, in this uh, uh, seminar today. I think when he was talking about that uh, article in Julia, I was thinking in terms of where is Taka now? Is it in EM or is it in ET? And if it is in somewhere between EM and ET, our our challenge is to move from that, that state to ET state. And can we, I mean, then I was thinking, I mean, is it possible for Dhaka under a PAU scenario? I think the previous ITU scenario is almost impossible to do that in the PAU scenario. And the challenges that he has posed, I mean, the, the intelligence that he has given that the land is very scary in Dhaka. And also, you have severe infrastructure issues in Dhaka. Also, coordination also is a major issue. I think I was read somewhere in the seventh plan that uh, there are 18 ministries and 42 agencies are involved in governing Dhaka city, which is a nightmare. I think it has to be uh, coordinated better. And the other issue is that uh, the the uh, I think the city is just create a uh, surplus, but in Dhaka in Bangladesh, I think it is all appropriated by the landowners. I think there is no, it's uh, my understanding, maybe Zidrubai can correct that one or Sartre correct that one, that it's being approved by the land owner. And if, if that is the case, if we don't have a, I mean, uh, the mechanism to take that uh, surplus to, for uh, the infrastructure development, I think that uh, this city will tend to create more inequality. If we continue to do that, I mean, it will create more inequality uh, uh, in, in, in society. But also, I mean, we found that this has not been captured in, in our surveys and other things. We found that uh, the inequality is even more or less same in, Dhaka, in Bangladesh and also the urban inequality on the other hand is declining. So, so there are some also data issues that we talked about. And um, then I think I think that we are now uh, preparing, the government is now preparing. I like one of the phrases that I think uh, our, I mean, the country's development strategy should be the country's urbanization strategy. 
So it doesn't the case. I mean, we are not preparing a perspective plan. Dr. started preparing perspective plan. So my question, then I was also thinking, uh, now what should planning commission do? Should they change from a perspective plan to try to find out a urban, a urban strategy? And that will tend to solve our most of the problem. Uh, I don't know how to define uh, cities in Bangladesh. Are they dysfunctional? I mean, they are inefficient, obviously, we know. But are they dysfunctional? I don't know. Uh, so those information are not uh, in front of us. But if, if, if that is the case, again, this backdrop, we also set very ambitious everlasting goals, like anywhere in zero extreme poverty by 2030. Then, I mean, attending the upper middle income status by 2031. And then, higher income status by 2041. So if we I mean, achieve those things, I think we will be uh, surpassing the uh, impressive uh, I mean, uh, achievements of Korea and also China. But my understanding, I mean, I mean, if we piece to all this together, I, I think it's almost impossible to uh, I mean, achieve those targets under this uh, nice cultural system and all those things. I think that is what uh, one of the take of today's discussion. The other discussion point that I found that the urbanization cannot be led to market alone. Uh, I mean, the state or the public sector has an important role to play. But at the same time, the public institution has to be accountable, uh, functional, and efficient. Uh, and I like to press three questions that I have in mind uh, for Professor Bani, but also uh, regarded um, I mean, uh, discussion. One is that uh, there is a relationship between, as you said, that livability and productivity. Now, is it possible? I mean, also in your paper you said about that Chinese cities are more productive than you. But in, in uh, how, I mean, the Mo uh, Mumbai is productive, but not, not, not that livable. Now, in the case, uh, is it possible that I mean, you continue to be productive in a lesser uh, livable condition? This is one uh, question. And another question is in, in, in terms of Bangladesh, I think that we have achieved 7% plus growth. Uh, and maybe, I think, if we, uh, if there is the expectation that we continue to grow above 5 to 7% uh, for another 5 6 years. But under this uh, city condition, uh, I mean, is there, is there a point where the growth will target to quarter to 6% even 5%? That's another question. The last question is that, um, Sometimes you hear about that, uh, I mean, city government, a autonomous and empowered city government is the solution to the dysfunctional problem of uh, developing countries. With that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandelberg, for the excellent intervention. I, I was just tempted to add one more with you, what you uh, already said, our three questions. Uh, just, I think it's not a question, but just a uh, uh, thought to uh, uh, issue to discuss. Uh, whether Bangladesh or, or, or whether Dhaka is a kind of unique case, because I also read uh, Professor Venable's articles on where it's very nice he was comparing Chinese cities with cities in India and Africa. Uh, the kind of uh, context where we are in Bangladesh, the kind of very land is very scarce and highly dense population. And then uh, the kind of, uh, even when I go to Delhi, I can see Delhi is expanding. Uh, Mumbai is also, they have land for expansion. But we are kind of constrained, and there is a huge issue of the choice between agricultural land, industrial land, and also the, you know, how, how the residential land. And it's a huge challenge in Dhaka city. So how do you really, you know, think that, you know, put that issue in the, in the context, whether you consider Dhaka is a kind of exceptional case, and whether the standard policy issues will really be applied, or we need to think much more beyond that. Uh, with this, may I now request uh, Professor Mustafa Rahman to make some comments? Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Professor Anthony Manabu, uh, our special guest, the chairman of the department, and the chair. Uh, Mr. and the fellow uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, let me register my deep appreciation uh, for this very kind invitation to share some of my thought, thoughts uh, on a paper which has been presented by someone uh, from whom I have learned a lot and I'm coming to that. 
Uh, but uh, first of all, also let me uh, congratulate the organizers, Sanin and World Bank, and as far as I understand, the Economic Study Center was also a partner. I think I should mention that as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> I think that uh, that uh, Professor Venables and his seminal works on uh, has deepened our understanding about poverty, which is so important for, for Bangladesh. And these special dimensions of urbanization and special dimensions of managing urbanization, I think is very important in the context of our country. Now, if we uh, look at uh, the experience of uh, Africa and Asia, which uh, Professor Venables in his writings are extensive and extensively covered, I see some difference which was mentioned uh, just now by Dr. Khandalka. Uh, I was looking at the per capita, not income, but per, per square kilometer GDP in, in Bangladesh and in Africa and some of the countries where Professor Venables has, has worked on. And I was looking at very interesting, you know, although the per capita income in Bangladesh is quite low compared to many of these countries, if you look at per square kilometer GDP in per capita you know, purchasing power uh, dollars is 4.2 million dollars in Bangladesh, which is 1.7 times in China, 1.6 times in India, and it is 20 times that of Africa. So it is a very densely activated you know, country. So when we talk about urbanization, we will also have to keep in mind the sort of, because if we are talking about special dimensions of development. So this intensity of activity in Bangladesh is something which has to be kept in mind. Now, I think what we also have to add to what Professor Venables has mentioned, of course we need efficient urbanization, but I think we also need sustainable urbanization, we also need inclusive urbanization. It has come in his, in his deliberation, but this is very important that we want a Bangladesh which is economically developed, socially inclusive, and environmentally sustainable. This is one of the most vulnerable countries climate was in the world. So we can't talk about urbanization without sustainable and resilient urbanization, which is very, very important. So I would say that some of the market mechanisms which Dr. Venables has mentioned, but he has mentioned about the externalities, obviously, positive and negative. So, so that will capture, but being in Bangladesh and being in Dhaka city, I think that this is very important. Now, we have to think about urbanization at a time when, you see, Bangladesh has to face urbanization at a very low per capita income, it's only $1,600. If we look from 1960, the total population has increased by less than three times in Bangladesh, but urban population has increased by 17 times. So that has been the pace of urbanization that we are having to face. So this one we have to keep in mind. Now, so we will have to have urbanization in the era of SDGs. I think that is very important because some of the econometric analysis and the market-based solutions which have, uh, have Professor Venables has mentioned, uh, I think that we will also have, and he has very rightly mentioned that urbanization is very policy intensive. I would say also that it is also policy sensitive. So if we really, for example, the, the low equilibrium and the high equilibrium which he has mentioned and Dr. Khandakar was mentioning about how to go from EL to ET and one of the solutions is the market-based solutions that we tax the land and the surplus created in the cities through land taxation. But given that, you know, we, are, we have already, you know, we are, uh, we are faced with some contextual reality. So is it really possible for us to really tax land to the extent that it will generate the resources for the infrastructure? Now I think that in any densely populated country like ours, I think if we can devise instruments which can pay, raise the financing for the infrastructure, I think that is what uh, we will have to think about, whether we should go for creation of uh, bonds, uh, should we raise uh, funds through, through some innovative instruments for infrastructure, because as distinct from Africa, 
I think in countries such as Bangladesh, user fees will always be able to generate a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, financing for infrastructure because, for example, in Africa, if I build a bridge, it may serve 50,000 people and 50,000 people may be paying the tolls. But in Bangladesh, perhaps it will be serving 5 million people. So to that extent, infrastructure, raising financing for infrastructure through through these innovative um, innovative instruments, I think it will be a more more sort of a practical issues, knowing the political economy of, of Bangladesh and 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 the difficulty in taxing uh, taxing the people because these people are very powerful people. One question what was also coming to my mind was that. A lot of land in the urban areas is also owned by, by, by the state itself. So how do you also make best use of that state land? And that brings me to the, another issue which Professor Venables mentioned about housing and affordable housing. And, and you see that in many of our countries, and Bangladesh has 570 urban centers, of which Dhaka is the only mega city, the other four are you know, metropolitan cities and we have 25 cities which are more than one lakh people. So, in, in, so what we see that in many of these urban areas, it is slamization and urbanization is coterminous almost. 40% of the people are live in slums. In Bangladesh, the latest figure for 2010 was that we will need 4.1 million new housing uh, facilities. And by 2021, it will be 8.6 million. So, how do you address issues of uh, affordable, affordable um, habitat for, for the people? How do you uh, address the issues of slumization? I've read in one of uh, Professor Venable's uh, uh, writings with regard to uh, the, the slums are sort of mini land grabbers. Uh, 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 that was, the, I think, the word was issued. Uh, but, but in in Bangladesh, for example, land in the slums are oh, uh, it is in many cases is state land grabbed by very powerful political people. And so, and 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 the slum dwellers are living there. There is also alternative theory that you make them owners of the land, and then they can also invest. So, because forty three percent of the Dwellings in Dhaka city is uh, is 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 uh, non-permanent. So how do you incentivize people to build permanent habitat? So I think this is also very very important to, to think about how how we, is is market mechanism really helpful? The other question obviously is with regard to the governance, and there are very you know, lot of insights uh, with with regard to uh, uh, governance. Uh, in, in in many of uh, some of the works of Professor Venables, which I have read and I have learned a lot, uh, the, the China comes out to be very uh, efficient in terms of urban planning, and which is right. But he also makes a distinction between common interest states and uh, represent states. One dichotomy, the other dichotomy is is democracy and autocracy. And in some of the autocracies. The common interests like urbanization are best served. So th that's a really dilemma for a countries like Bangladesh. So you see that in China, you know, autocracies address common interests. So and in Bangladesh context, too, we sometimes you know, see the debate about democracy versus development. So I think that it is very important how within democratic polity through devolution of power, through strengthening of the institutions, we can address these common interests. So I think that that is, that is very important political economy message that I want to take from Professor Venable's uh, excellent uh, presentation. As I uh, was mentioning, I was also have, have been reading, of course, his other, other uh, writings as well. And what for me as a, as a researcher was very important, I would like to mention it, uh, uh, is that you know, we have these special dimensions of poverty, and we have prof from Professor Venables from uh, a lot of insight with regard to special dimensions of development. So I think that combining those two is very important, not only in the context of urbanization, but also in the context of development to Bangladesh as an inclusive society. And the last point will be, I read many years back that 
any country, and I would like to request <laughs> Professor Benoist to give answer to that. I read many years back that a country which surpasses six hundred dollar per capita income should have an underground metro. Metro. So we, we are looking at various solutions in Bangladesh. So I would like to request you to give this from because this is very important for Bangladesh, as many of the urban planners are telling that this has become a sign of one on for Bangladesh and we have seen how in India in mid-1990s the first metro was built in, in, in Kolkata. So I think that urban transport is also becoming an issue and, and, and what modality will be the best that is also something that we should think about. So once again, thank you very much for expanding this <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mukherjee. Very excellent points and I think uh, very interesting uh, you know, interventions. So may I request uh, Dr. Mukherjee to come First of all, I join my other fellow panelists in thanking Mr. Benedict for introducing us to his rich thinking and for Sanin and the World Bank to have made this possible. And the issue of in front of us is not just an academic issue, though, you know, it was presented in academic terms. It has, as the panelists mentioned, it is absolutely a real life issue and it has a lot of implications. Uh, Sumit Rahan had some expectations of political economy input from Dr. Venables, he added at the very end. So maybe I'll concentrate on that part. I think uh, following on most of this point, one initial uh, point to emphasize is that shall we be thinking about cities or shall we be thinking about urbanization? Because uh, we can think of cities as discrete spatial entities or we can think of a system of cities, hinterlands and economic growth corridors. So the way we think about that actually has policy implications. So I think it's uh, important that particularly in Bangladesh context, with such a uh, huge land uh, population pressure in a small landmass, that we think about urbanization, which is a collection of cities which are linked, but cities also have the hinterlands, and the hinterlands play a role in that whole process. And in Bangladesh also, as you may know, some of our growth is along the transport corridors. So Dhaka Chittagong, growth corridor. Dhaka Narsingh, up to Silet, another growth corridor. Jomuna Bridge has been built, so up to Rangpur, gradually we may have a growth corridor. the Bridge gets built, we may extend into the south, southern Bangladesh. So these specificities of the urbanization process is what we have to keep in mind. Certainly cities, of course, then come in as a very important uh, and there are cities, suddenly cities like Dhaka obviously merits uh, independent attention because they have, by the sheer size of their scale, which is, you know, they provide roughly a uh, very big part of the economic growth of Bangladesh, also holds a huge part of the uh, urban population of Bangladesh. So they have, but as a whole, it's very important to think of not cities and villages, but cities together with villages. The agglomeration has been mentioned, of course. But that's why I, uh, you know, recently in our work, we have preferred to use the word urban spectrum as a new way of thinking. Before we used to think cities and villages are two different words. No longer the case. We have Dhaka city, we have then district, Upazala, and then go to the remotest area, and there also we see urban way of life actually dominating. So it's a urban spectrum that we are looking at, at the top of which sits, of course, Dhaka city. Unfairly so in many cases, in terms of uh, attracting the attention from the government. But it is important that, that's the first point I would highlight. That we think in Bangladesh context is the urban spectrum, which includes actually rural, non-farm, and all other areas, uh, issues. I think uh, in terms of the political economy issue, it is extremely important what uh, uh, Professor Venables in his paper, read the paper, uh, the importance of how we are talking about urbanization has a important consequences, which means that the urban vision, 
How are you talking about urbanization? That is very important. Our policymakers, right now, even though we mentioned that urban is the future, but if you go to the, from the prime ministers downward or the president downward, if you go to their policy meetings, they will still be saying people need to be kept in the villages and the rural is the priority and those sort of thinking still dominates it. So urban vision is a very important and that's why it's so important to this seminar and I want to really applaud also the audience presence. I mean, uh, last time we had some meetings here, it was only up to three rows. Now I see the entire room is filled up. So the, the reason is that the issue is a very, very important one. And the transition in the policy mindset, we talked of governance, but at the, there is a problem at the mindset level also, where there is a reluctance to accept that urbanization is already on our doorsteps, is happening. They are living there to enjoy the benefits, but unwilling to accept it as a policy priority. And making that transition, making breaking that mindset is a very, very important work that we have to do and by the type of discussion we bring forward on the, uh, on the, on the urban vision. The other point is uh, urbanization obviously is very dynamic, etc. I think a very important political economy issue is the whole question of uh, Professor Zanetlis mentioned about this, you know, the premium from the land, the spike in land value, who gets the premium, who gets the urban surplus. That is of course a very, very critical issue and the answers are very clear in the context of Bangladesh. Which you know, our center of the PRC did a survey last year and if we looked at Dhaka's income, 6% of Dhaka's top richest people, they control 40% of Dhaka's income. And bottom 58%, they control 21% of Dhaka's income. So it's already it was very clear who is getting the surplus from the, uh, from the land. This is very important issue and I think there, in terms of the urban vision, the very important point that Professor Venables highlighted at the very outset productivity and livability and the necessity of making a balance between the two. Also, uh, Kundukar mentioned where, up to when shall we focus on productivity, when should livability come into focus. I don't know whether we should think in those temporal sense or we must, you know, really focus on both in a, in a, in a manner. But one of the political economy issues we see is that Urban investments are being dominated by elite thinking. If you look at urban infrastructure, if you look at the way the investments are made, elite type of understanding of investment is, you know, flyover versus commuter train is an, you know, immediate example. This is an underlying issue that elite interest shape the way policy thinking about urban investment is being determined and it's important to bring that into focus and hit at that that uh, th that this issue of where the proper investment is to be done and there sometimes we tend to run too much with productivity at the cost of livability we said that no it's important to get into productivity very important but eventually even productivity doesn't happen if you, the investment is not a proper one. So that I think is a very important uh, political economy issue. I want to introduce a, actually a new issue for some time that I've been thinking very much that this is an issue we now need to discuss. Is when we use the word infrastructure, what, do, what comes to our mind when you think about infrastructure? Is it the concrete? In reality, what comes to our mind is only the concrete. There's a bridge, there's a flyover, that's infrastructure. Go to Mayor Hani flyover as an example, which has allowed the industrialists of Narayangan living in Dhaka to travel faster to Narayangan. 
but you look below that infrastructure and you see a living hell actually for the local population and there are many newspaper articles have been written on this. How infrastructure did not mean for those who were giving the money for this and building that infrastructure that they needed to think of it as a whole. If you make that flyover, but below that you also improve the situation so that the population below that also. Now you have a situation of some people having cut their commuting time and a whole lot of other people, in fact uh, multiple times of other people are having to struggle more with their time. At the end of the day, who has won? Has Dhaka won? Not at all. So when you think of infrastructure, I think it is important to bring in, even within the idea of infrastructure, we have to bring in governance. It's very important. Infrastructure cannot only be the concrete. That's the elite way of thinking. Behavioral protocols, not just this. How do you use infrastructure? We see that you know the bus stops just before the flyover starts. Slows down everyone. So you have an investment, a world class infrastructure, but a third world behavioral reality, including you know the opposite sides, travel and all that. So infrastructure has to be understood together with the governance, particularly in contexts like ours. Without that, you may make the investment, but you will not have the productivity outcome. Because at the end of the day, Dhaka's travel time has not decreased. Despite these flyovers and everything, travel time in fact continues to be higher and getting higher and higher despite this investment. So I think it's extremely important that we think about infrastructure in a, in a sort of new way where governance is inbuilt into this whole issue. Uh, I think uh, many other issues were mentioned, but in terms of looking ahead, uh, it's a very difficult situation in Bangladesh, but nevertheless, as Mustafiz mentioned, as Bosu mentioned, that we have been growing, and per square kilometer, it's a very intensive activity. So the Transformation history of Bangladesh actually has been the story of grassroots initiatives, individual initiatives, or group initiatives. People have not stood idle. They decided to do something and experiment. And I think the urban agenda is probably telling us that there is a limit to this. As, you, as Professor Ben Abel also mentioned, it's a policy intensive agenda. There is a limit to which the solution to, I think the, I thank the chairman of the department, made an interesting discussion, this, this thing, uh, referred to the two mayors, or the mayors, that they have introduced this new vocabulary of public sector mosquitoes and private sector mosquitoes. <laughs> <coughs> this distinction has come because of uh, in a way, we are thinking of the whole thing in a sort of a disaggregated, in a fragmented sort of way. So, I would really say that uh, the, we are in a situation where the growth of Dhaka and the urbanization process in Bangladesh is going to continue, but there is a urban agenda is telling us that the way Bangladesh has brought itself forward to this extent by the initiative of the common people, there is a limit to that. At some point, public policy, collective action, because this mosquito, chikungunya, is not about this public sector and private sector mosquito. It's about also preparedness, timely deployment of the uh, mosquito killers. It's about also looking at the habitats where these things happen. It's about the preparedness of the hospitals. 
So it's a lot of things together. So I think perhaps in the urban agenda context, Bangladesh will have to come up with how the policy and the initiative together they come together and uh, there was one uh, academic issue in Professor Benedict's uh, lecture which I just wanted to touch on. You mentioned about tradable and non-tradable sectors in the cities and I know there is a rich tradition of sociologists or anthropologists who have some questions on that you know how the non-tradable sector can also be underwriting the uh, lower cost of the tradable sector you know like the informal house help housemates who are in the informal sector are allowing the tradable sector to sort of uh, perform their duties. So the tradable and non-tradable, uh, I wonder whether they should be seen as two distinct spheres or the linkage between the two. Because we think of informal sector is a you know, sector to be left behind, etc. But without the informal sector, much of the informal sector also may not survive for long. So I think for economic students, there is an important issue here of how the two informal and formal how they to interact and whether there are lessons to be learned there which uh, we should be thinking about. But as a whole, I think it was an excellent lecture and I will end on again a political economy issue which is that we have been asking, most of us give a good answer that we need funds for urban development. Where will we get it from? The land premium was an answer, has been an answer in many cities. Most of this has been, uh, you know, suggested user fees as a possibly a better solution in the context of Bangladesh. Uh, this is a political economy issue because state has a lot of land, a lot of urban land. But one problem there is that this public land is being privately appropriated. If you look at the way the Housing societies are coming up, you know, of the of particular public sector agencies, but it's a private. So the private appropriation of public of, by of public officials is an issue. So uh, for the context of Bangladesh, I think that's important. But I end on this point: we need to think of urban not just as cities, as a as a complex. And secondly, we are nowhere near winning the urban agenda. Policy makers still don't think it's important and whatever they thinking they are doing is dominated by elite interest. We have to really attack that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinjiraman, for excellent interventions. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing when he was talking about infrastructure. Uh, uh, I thought that the policy makers in countries like Bangladesh, they are so inclined to develop the big infrastructures like flyovers or similar kinds of things. But the small infrastructure and which are also interlinking infrastructures are very important. Uh, they are largely ignored. That's why I just want to borrow the term from, from some of the Sen, uh, that you may also end up with uh, a large supply of infrastructure, but the kind of entitlement failure of infrastructure. So, we may find that the, the citizens, they are not really able to enjoy the benefits of the large supply of So with this, we have uh, around 10 minutes. So I'd like to uh, invite a few questions from the audience. And we can extend time a bit, but not too much, because uh, uh, there are yes, yes. Uh, yes, sir, please. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Actually, it is a very interesting and very important. It is not only important, the title was a title, one sentence says, Awareness of strategy, develop a strategy is 
Now, I want to say strategies of organization level of payment, these are strategies of level of payment. I think it's true, because this, uh, we are talking about organization, people living in our area, but this problem of organization, it, it touches all the people, not only in our people, but in our area. Just the, our experience uh, uh, of the developed countries have inspired us to, to develop a descriptive model for our of the developing countries, regardless of the social economic structure. The idea behind this uh, thinking was that the, as I say, already said, that our relation is natural and it is indispensable for industrialization and modernization. So it is, in the European countries, the our relation and the, this industrial revolution and industrial revolution went hand in hand. The people who ousted from the rural areas came to the cities and town became the industrial revolution. And in our country, the cause of our is completely different. It is kind of the agrarian crisis, which pushed the people out of land. So, so the, today, we are talking about the aberration, the strategy of aberration. And in Dhaka, it is already no, no, no more livable. We have, you know, like every day, almost every day, we one sentence is mentioned that is the that is the second worst world in the world. In 2007, the World Bank study show because of congestion in Dhaka City, the country should be losing almost two percent of GDP. This is the second So what is so because of the high congestion in Dhaka cities, the role of metropolis is clear. Hmm. Because the advantage of the economics we call the generation of the scope and the scale. Now my question is whether this, there is any scope and the scale in other cities because of high condition. There are two factors of migration. There's a push, full factor, push factor. In Bangladesh, there is push factor. I don't think the full factor is now in operation. Because people are moving to the cities without a job. In Naga, almost 70% of the people is in that is a, uh, what is called it is a informal sector. Mm. So, Dhaka is congested, it is not a livable, but still it is, some, it is a magnet and drawing all the resources that people from the rest of the world. Right. There are some strategies earlier for is the growth for strategy, counter macro strategy, and this is that because uh, for the this, uh, there are our policy number is very much efficient in making policies, but completely inefficient in implying materializing these policies. So we are getting policies almost every five or ten years, but situation is becoming worse. So my day, so what is the we have seen many suggestions here. So as I say the people are my thing that's that from the rural areas. It is the population pressure, it is the loss of inheritance, it is the deprivation of the whole rural areas, the lack of opportunity, elevation of public sectors, uh, this is the one. And bureaucracy is. So, Dhaka is so attractive now, even it is the livable. So, how to decentralize? The question is question. We have the local level government, but this local level is called um, in inactive. Yeah. It, is, it should be activated. So can I talk about this here? Uh, last right now. So the growth for strategy. Uh, can we talk about the making the counter magnet of data cities? Hmm. <coughs> Centering Russia, Polisha, or elsewhere. Hmm. So we are developing the infrastructure. From Dhaka to Chittagong, it is now four lanes. And from Dhaka to Manaching, it is coming to four lanes, but we are it is taken at the same time because almost half of the roads of Dhaka managing is to provide with standing parks and all that. Same with the Dhaka to Chittagong. So, what is the problem here? It is not only, it is the question of the, say, uh, decentralization. It is also a question of yeah, administration, the bureaucracy. And so, I think, I think. Dhaka should be decentralized, 
to not only for the Dhaka city but also the whole people of India. There should be the solution to both the after the construction. So there was the, the Jomna bridge and Jomna bridge was constructed because the Dhaka was decentralized. But at the contrary, it, it, it increased the migration from the north to north below the Dhaka city. Same could also happen when the Punjab bridge is completed. So I think unless until the similar opportunities and facilities are provided in, the, in these areas like the Mauritian, Mauritian, and the rest of the Russia in other areas. We can talk about many times, we can make seminars, we can plan many stuff, it will be very unnecessary. So thank you very much for this. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I request, uh, request uh, yes, sir. Uh, so any students who would be really like to make some questions, uh, I will come back to you. Yes, yes. I would like to have questions from the students first. Uh, you are a student? Okay, please. Be quick uh, and please very be brief also. And the back, I can see a few hands. Can you please come forward, those who have raised hands? Please. And be very brief. Yes, sir. So I'm a student of the Commerce Department from the Magnetic Lab and I have Magnetic Lab. So my question was, uh, the unique problem that we have in Dhaka, the main problem that uh, Sir and Hapshan uh, talked about was decentralization. So how do we make this decentralization possible in case of Bangladesh? And I would like to talk uh, a little bit about the infrastructures that we are seeing. In Bangladesh, we have, uh, we're seeing this trend of making uh, flyovers um, in my own city, that is Kumila. We have seen flyovers are being built, but at the same time, the roads are backing. So we are not actually getting the actual benefit of the flyovers because uh, the it's making it really yeah. So how can we tackle these problems uh, with policies? Thank you. Coordinated you. policies. Thank you. Can I have the next question from the students? Please. Sir, I'm Dagdwan Bashti and I'm doing masters in economics. So my question is in South Asian countries, most of the we have most of the developing countries and the common problems like urbanization leads to overpopulate the city and this obviously puts a cost on uh, the productivity and also positive external we talked about due to urbanization should be seen. So um, the question is the ambition of being a middle income country of Bangladesh, is it consistent with the kind of cost that the cities are bearing for this kind of inefficiencies uh, of overpopulation or the cost of overpopulation? Okay, thank you. Next one, please. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Shoro. I am pursuing my master's from renewable energy technology from Dhaka University. Uh, we know that every urban area drives on energy, like transportation and factories, industries, and households. We need energy, and most of the time, this energy comes from fossil fuels. My question is: in terms of sustainable urbanization, where uh, is the compatibility with this fossil fuel or present energy infrastructure, and where do you see the uh, future of renewable energy in this sector? Thank you. Very good. The next question, please, from the students. I'm not a student, I'm a journalist. So, sir, my question is to you. I'm working in Delhi Home of Health. The thing is that there is a huge discussion and there is a huge uh, presentation. So, I'll, I, I, I'll just drive to Mr. Ben Nevels that would you please make some comments on the Dhaka City's development and how we can solve the solution, the problems. And uh, be specific, some brief words of you that we can come up in four and five minutes. It will be easier for us. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions from the students? I can see one more hand. Uh, please, please, please. Uh, you were saying that increasing productivity in the cities and the urban areas. So, if you also increase the productivity, there would be an incentive in the third world perspective of the African nations. There are huge chunk of people from the rural areas of the agriculture sector. They will left behind their agriculture sector and come to the, uh, uh, in the urban cities. What the problem is with, uh, I believe, I think that the African nation or the, the South Asian nation, nation, we have to ensure food security. Don't you think that this will create and um, this will this in, in, incentivize you, uh, you people to leave their agriculture sector and there will be a uh, danger in the food security problem in, in the, these countries? Good, very good. Uh, next question from the students. Yes, I can see the hand. Okay, I'll, I'll guess first <laughs> to exhaust from this side. 
Okay, uh, in the other hand, this side. I'll, I'll exhaust this side and I'll come back to this. Yes, please. Uh, this is the infrastructure has been built, that there are enough infrastructure in the country. But what about the lack of qualified personnel, like doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers, to lead the cities? What happens about that? Bangladesh has a huge population, but there is a lack of qualified personnel. What can be done about that? Very good. Uh, next one, I can see the hand there, just, just behind you. Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, I just finished my master's from South Asian University of Indian Design. Um, so the other article that came out in Guardian a few days back says that cutting down in fossil fuel is not enough for um, for uh, getting down the uh, effect of climate change. Uh, so we have to find something new economic system to make the world and make the environment more sustainable. So all all my forty four year bachelor and two years of master in the classroom that we need more growth, we need more productivity. But is this the ultimate thing of economics to change towards the productivity, but not the climate or the environment? Because Dhaka is surrounded by Bolivia, which is completely destroyed by the uh, industry surrounding it, uh, which is also affecting the rural areas and rural livelihood, which is around Dhaka. So how do we deal with that? And is Productivity is the ultimate target of urbanization because if you think about it, I mean, uh, a lot of the cities, if, we, uh, if the production process is mechanized, then what will happen? The labor will not get the surplus, I and mean, there will be no labor which will be uh, used in the production process itself. So, who will we get the benefits from that? I mean, we get more productivity, we get more higher GDP. Okay. Oh, yes, but thank you. Thank you. So you got your thank point. You. Uh, Yes, I will have this, then I will move to this side. It's here. And then, of course, you. Yes. I am Shimon. I am from 96 Pass of Egan Supermarket. From your lecture, we have come to know that there are two implications of uh, urbanization. One is uh, virtuous implication, and other is peaceful implication. So, sir, please, if you please mention, if you could better for me to understand that. Are there any possible uh, solutions of this business implication in terms of Dhaka? Thank you. Okay, yes, now in the front, please. First of all, I would like to thank you very much for arranging this center, uh, the lecture by Professor Anthony Benbos. Uh, I think this was needed um, pretty much earlier than now. Is, uh, than now. So I'm going straight to my questions. I would like to draw your attention to a number of terms that we have used, such as um, optimization by uh, Professor Nadma, balance by yourself, and primacy by yourself. So I would like to draw your attention to the fact that Haka is um, over-urbanized, you mentioned. And in terms of privacy, Haka is not in an optimal situation. So I would uh, request you to give us some recommendations about the economy's way of addressing this problem, such as the mode of transport, the way it is creating problem, and the, the behavioral issues that the Professor Dilu uh, Rahman mentioned. And the other uh, other side is my own suggestion uh, or, um, or to you, whether you can uh, develop some kind of partnership with Sanem or uh, the University of Dhaka to delve into the problem that you're facing in the city of Dhaka. Can you please give us some recommendations based on your global knowledge on urbanization, how we can optimize it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, is there a hand this side? Yes, one hand, please. Uh, and then this is the final question. Okay, uh, I'm India Ramit. Uh, I'm pursuing the master's, master's degree. Uh, and uh, my question is uh, about the uh, second. Uh, 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 said that. Uh, the interior of the urban system can be ensured through uh, getting attention on uh, uh, on local specialization. But uh, uh, for the same thing, Dhaka, we uh, we uh, only learned that uh, forty-four percent of the people are staying in slum, and also the infrastructure that is developed in the type of flyover is not intentionally not there. So, 
Cities are green. Okay, you know, energy use uh, is per person is, is generally less in cities uh, than in rural areas. Certainly in developed countries, because you know, living in smaller places, half the block, whatever. So cities are green. Now that obviously a lot more needs to be done for the environment within cities and, and globally. But, but, but cities are green. Um, so on the food security question, I'm going to give a very straight economics answer which is, well, if people need agriculture, the food becomes scarce, the price will go up, and there will be a supply response. So I don't, don't actually put food security very high up my list of worries. There is an economic mechanism there that you know, generally, generally works. Um, there are also good, good points on skills um, that let me not, not to touch on. <coughs> Excuse me. Four or so sort of general, more, more general observations, hopefully picking up some of what we're saying. First, livability. L livability is, is obviously the, the, the ultimate objective, right? We don't want growth for the sake of growth, we want livability. So, so that, that goes up as, as, as objective. Uh, productivity is, is a means uh, to livability. Um, but it's the other way around as well. I mean, livability is a means to productivity. Now, the way I often think about, you know, when I think about cities, I think, well, you know, I'm an investor. I want to know where do I put my factory? Where do I put it? Do I put it in a city where people are absolutely miserable, um, they're spending hours commuting, um, but probably demanding high pay to cause a compensating di di um, differential for the miserableness of all their, their commuting and things? No, I put my factory in a place with a livable environment. Uh, you know, maybe labor is actually cheaper though, certainly yeah, might be much more productive. So the ultimate objective is livability. Uh, productivity is a means to that, but livability is also a means to, to, to productivity, I think. Uh, second comment. Yeah, political economy issues I sort of deliberately avoided. Um, partly because I don't know much about them in general, and particularly because I don't know anything about them in, uh, in, in, in Bangladesh. But um, nevertheless, a couple of comments and reactions to what was said. Now, I do think a sort of integrated authorizing environment is very, very important, as I said. Um, I do think that city authorities should have a fiscal base, uh, yeah, a revenue stream uh, of their own if they're going to be able to, to act, act effectively. Um, user charges are uh, part of that. Various business licenses and things are probably a very bad part of that. And then they're not things you want to tax. Um, many cities, uh, uh, most, have property taxes of some form or another that raise you know, some part of revenue uh, for, for the city. So, I would, I would make the case for property taxes. And also, of course, um, a lot of cities, if, if infrastructure is built that causes a sharp appreciation of values around the, the infrastructure project, many cities try and um, capture part of that for a sort of land, land value uplift uh, thing. So, so there are ways of doing it. Um, also, also on the political economy, I really strongly agree with the point you made that, yeah, it's just really important to get central government thinking about cities uh, as a platform for development, 
in a place where most of the people live um, and, and, and just thinking spatially. Third, quick comments. Uh, China, I think I mentioned it during the talk, but it came up several times. Of course, in a sense, the essence of Chinese ability to, to, to build effectively in cities was that the state owned the land. Um, so it captured the surplus. Um, now, you know, obviously, compensation was paid to the peasants uh, evicted, but it surely wasn't full market value compensation. So it, it financed, uh, so you know, Chinese success in the sense of exactly this capturing the surplus um, and other, other politically obvious things. Uh, but that was a large part of it, which I suspect also has you know, an obvious message for state lands, state owned lands. Um, in, in, in this country. Um, final <coughs> comment, uh, rather large and sprawling one. Um, yeah, urban, urban versus city, spectrum, the term urban spectrum. I was sort of nodding when you said it, but I think I actually prefer the term of urban hierarchy, right? It's certainly not just um, about you know one particular city. You have to think about the whole city structure. But I think I would make it a, a city structure. You know, sprawling along corridors uh, strikes me as being a pretty miserable way to live. You know, the city brings lots of social benefits, and cultural facilities, and things uh, as, as as well as economic ones. So yeah, but thinking about the whole hierarchy is, is really important. Um, and that takes us into the point of you know, Bangladesh just being very, very, very unusual. Uh, I saw someone correct these numbers when I say them. Uh, but a country with a population of 160 million, the second largest city has a population of less. Second, second largest. Three, three, three to four, and then you go, yeah. There's something called Zip's Law, which is an empirical regularity that says, you know, in your urban hierarchy, that the first city, the second city is half the size, third city is a third the size, right? But you know, the, the Bangladesh is way under that, right? Yeah, the second city is not seven million or eight million, and as you go further down, so, 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 so Bangladesh is unusual there, but then has excess privacy. So, 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 the, the, the question is what? Well, you know, I think Bangladesh does need to have some really thriving other cities. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean shipping up? I, I don't know. Does it mean new cities in the middle of nowhere? Surely not. <laughs> yeah, experience on that is not good. Does it mean um, the satellite cities close to in the edge on the edge of uh, Dhaka? Obviously, East Dhaka for itself is I don't know whether that counts for great, but that does count for great in Dhaka. But is it you know, going to be a distinct second centre? Um, I, I don't know. But yeah, clearly, the Bangladesh is unusual. Um, density is high, you know, crowding is an issue. So really thinking about the urban hierarchy as well as particular cities, I think is important. Thank you, Mr. Andrews. And I think uh, we had an excellent uh, session for the last two hours or so. I must thank uh, distinguished discussants. And I must thank World Bank for helping us have this uh, organized this event. And of course, the Economic Studies Center, student uh, organization, and our university, they also help us a lot. So thank you all. And we would uh, we'd like to we have a brief topic of conversation. Thank you everyone, thank you. Thank you.